Will y'all hold on just a minute because we're busy talking. Uh, do, we, do we really want to... Uh, don't, don't go away. We'll be right back. I mean, don't leave. Don't leave because this is on the test. Um, that always gets them, doesn't it? This is on the exam. You'll be testing on this. Could we do that and like spread it out here and eat it and talk about it on class? Sure. Okay, we need to pick a day. What? And, and we won't say McDonald's and Burger King are American food. That's not fair. We could do that. Let's pick out a day that we do that, and we'll just come and all eat off of people's stuff. And I guess you have to make stuff for, what, four, five, six people? A little dish? And we'll sample it on the air? And I'll bring Alka-Seltzer and uh, <laughs> Pepto-Bismol for... And, and uh, I don't mean this like it sounds, but nothing can be moving. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, yeah. I did eat a rattlesnake one time that we killed when I was a kid. And what's interesting is it's kind of like white meat of a chicken. But what's interesting is uh, the muscles are still contracting after you cut it up and put it in the pan and fry it. It kind of still wiggles. And uh, yeah, I, I was like that. For, for weeks I hissed. I don't know what that was about. But strange thing. Oh, I'm not even on. Am I on? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. Sometimes the camera comes on when we're not ready. Is it on? Is it still on, Stacy? Well, see, the light went off. Okay. Um, yes, hi, Dr. Herb again. Psychology class, cultural psychology. Have to get in that serious mode. Um, okay, I'm going to pass this around. We've got some interesting stuff today to talk about. I want to talk a little bit more about ego development. And, uh, and we need to figure out when we're going to do the food thing. So, like next Thursday or next... Tuesday or something. Anyway, we'll think about that. But uh, we'll let y'all watch a seat. On, on, y'all get to watch a seat, so it'll be good. We'll have a cross-cultural eat fest. Yes. Oh, without them on TV. Ooh. Forget the essay and I'll test on your cooking skills? Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about it after... Uh, after uh, class uh, today. Um, let me read. This is, uh, this is actually a book of uh, poems written by high school students, and these are ubiquitous poems. Anybody, any culture, any time could have written them. And uh, this one is uh, by a girl named Becky. Actually, excuse me, her name is Stevie in here. Stevie, S-T-E-V-I-E. -E. And years ago, I thought, that's such a Silly name for a, listen, listen to my prejudices and my, I thought, well, nobody would believe <coughs> uh, actually a young high school woman would have a name Stevie. And so I changed her name to Becky because I thought that would read better when I read this poem. <laughs> and it took me about 10 years to realize how I disc Stevie because this poem is about she's searching for her identity and I changed her name. And <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, let me do this. Let me read this. Uh, it's called, Everybody Liked Stevie. But this could be any of our names. Male, female, any tribe, culture, heritage. Because she was a clown. Many people liked her. I liked her too. I couldn't help it, but someone forgot to turn off the laughter switch inside of Stevie. She would turn on without warning. Her eyes and face and heart and mouth would pop in all directions like corn bursting out of a bowl. Stevie was a clown who loved life, and that meant pain. See if you can feel some of Stevie's cry in the poem she wrote, it's like a 17-year-old high school student. Do you know what it's like to be a clown? Do you know what it's like to suffer from too many laughs? Do you know what it's like for a girl to be born a circus act? Do you know what it's like to have a funny bone for a brain? I thought that was cute. Do you? I don't have any white paint on my face, but I wear this mask. I have this silly smile that never changes. It's always there, and everyone expects it to be there. They like it that way. They enjoy a clown, and they use a clown, because they think a clown doesn't care about anything. I can't even enjoy a bad mood with other people. That's a strange luxury. You see, I have to be a clown. Whenever people tease me, I turn into an act, a fool standing on my head. I look up and I see a world full of upside-down people trying to be what they're not. I see so many 
people wearing strange, colorless makeup. And the longer they wear it, the harder it is to discover what kind of people they really are underneath. I'm waiting for someone to step behind my face and find me. Not Stevie, but me. And then she has a prayer. Lord, when will this Stevie be free to be me? Well, that's the heart cry of every human being. As we grow up carrying roles, we grow up with our gifts and talents and, and the, the roles of our culture, our religion, our family of origin. And then we're, and, and we kind of, the little sister, the big brother, the smart one, the silly one, the athletic one, the cute one, the serious one. And, and we go through life playing this role and everybody likes it and everybody's used to it. And, uh, but at some point in our life we go, wait, I'm a lot more than this mask I'm wearing. I'm a lot more than uh, what you see out front. And as she says, when can I, someone, I'm waiting for someone to step behind my face and find not Stevie, but find me, the person. And of course, that's what psychology is all about. Um, those of you in the class, remember the thing I handed you about ego development, that little handout? You all are looking at me like you're on drugs or half asleep. But uh, why don't you get that out because I'm going to read over that and uh, I'm going to go back here and sit down. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, the ego development. Um, if you have it, and those of you on... Uh, hello. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, it looks like this. Well, that's it. And, uh, oh wait, I need to look down. And for those of you who are watching on TV, if you just uh, check in the website and look under Cultural Psych ITV, and uh, you'll find the handouts, and like this is one. And, and let me just uh, share these. Actually, I got these at uh, both of these things. Uh, some of it's typed not too well, but then that's my, uh, I was in the blue group in third grade for handwriting and have never recovered from that. But, um, uh, that's my Henry. I, actually, I got this this from a 12-step program I used to go in uh, for years and years. I still go occasionally. Uh, it's a great support group, and uh, it's a good place to grow and check in and work on your own stuff. And But anyway, I got this at a 12-step at a group, and uh, let me just read it. Or do you want me to leave it here, Stacy, and look at it? I'll just read it, because they'll be reading it at home. <clears throat> when they're having their chicken pot pie dinner, watching my class. Uh, the first one is, I affirm that. And, and this, is, this is when you, when you have a good sense of who you are in the world over time and, work, and have a, an awareness of, of your life, you're able to I affirm that just for today. These are signs of e good ego development. Just for today, I will respect my own and others' boundaries. We haven't talked about that. We may in, in, in a few classes to come. Just for the day, I will be vulnerable with someone I trust. And remember, vulnerable means able to be wounded. See? I'm able to share something that's personal. Uh, just for today, I will take one compliment and hold it in my heart for a, just a fleeting moment, and I'll let it nurture me. Just for today, I will act in a way I would admire in someone else. I am a child of God. I am a precious person. I'm a worthwhile person. I'm beautiful inside and out. I love myself unconditionally. Now that's a hard one to do, is to love ourselves unconditionally. Most of us have a lot of self-loathing. There's certain things about ourselves we just beat up on for years and years, and it never goes away at some level. But to love ourselves unconditionally, just warts and all, I I. I I love myself and value who I am. See, that's a sign of someone with pretty good ego development. Good self-esteem is another way to put it. I have ample leisure time without feeling guilty. That's probably every college student. I deserve to be loved by myself and others. I am loved because I deserve love. You know, I'm on the planet. I need love. I deserve to be valued. I'm a child of God and I deserve love and peace and prosperity and serenity. I forgive myself for hurting others and, and my, myself and others. I forgive myself for letting others hurt me. I am willing to accept love. Many of us can love other people, but we can't accept it. 
I find as a therapist in my private practice, it's one of the biggest things. It's easy to love because you're controlling others at one level, but when you have to let people love you and value you, often that we're very uncomfortable with that. I'm not alone. I'm one with God in the universe. I'm whole and good. I'm capable of changing. And then on the back side of this, this is another signs of ego development. Is as a person, I have the right to, and then I add it in there, and this is probably, this is sort of postgraduate human development. <laughs> because when you have a sense of who you are, you want other people to have a sense of who they are. When you learn to love and value who you are, and see that your life has worth, and you're meant to enjoy and become and, and discover, then you respect other people do too. And they have a right. So I added in here, as a person, I have a right to, and others do too. This is kind of weird. Including my parents. My parents are both deceased, but... <laughs> uh, including the, my enemies. Including other races and cultures. Including other people of other sexual orientation. Including uh, people I don't understand and I fear. Including people I admire. I have a right to be myself, and so do you. I have a right to refuse requests without feeling selfish. <laughs> Which part of no don't you understand? I say it's the hardest thing for many of us in psychology to do because we're kind of natural codependents. We're rescuing people. And I have a right to be competent and proud of my accomplishments, and so do you. I have a right to feel and express my anger appropriately, not inappropriately. We can't do that, but to express it. I'm really mad. I'm really angry about something. And you have a right to tell me when you're angry at me and, and let me know if I've done something to offend you. I want you to, see, so that we can have clear communication. I have a right to ask for affection and help. I may be turned down, but I can't ask. I have a right to be treated as a capable adult. And so does everybody else. One thing I've learned out here in my, gosh, six years as a visiting professor and lecturer and get to you know meet every, so many different people from so many different places is that when you talk to people everybody's just the same but if you just go by looks and clothes or gait how you walk or something you can make judgments of people people will be scowling you say something to them and their just face lights up like becky and the popcorn you know yeah and you discover wow that's a capable maturing, growing, human being, adult behind that face. A couple more. Uh, be, I have a right to be illogical in making decisions. You can take this home and show it to your parents. Dr. Agan said <laughs> that I can be illogical. And others can too. You know how parents make these terribly illogical boundaries they put on teenagers? You can't. No, I don't. No. You know, and you're going like, chill out. It's okay. You know. It's going to be fine. Uh, I remember when my daughter, uh, and, and uh, she lived with me, a single parent her sort of through high school. And after she got her driver's license at 15 and a half, uh, it was about a month or two into it, she wanted to go to Austin to visit some friends. And uh, she said, Dad, I'm just, you know, she was a, like a junior at Lamar High School. So she said, I just want to go see if this girlfriend, I'll drive up Saturday, spend the night, come back Sunday. And I said, I don't think so. Dad, I'm, I'm, you know, I think she just turned 16 or something. I'm 16 years old. I can handle it. This was before we had cell phones, by the way. And I go, well, well I mean, somebody might molest you and mug you. <laughs> right, Dad. Somebody's just going to pull me over on the road and see how this fear and the father starts going. And she, uh, one of the things that I had insisted she do uh, was one of the boundaries I set is she had to take a self-defense course. When we were looking at fears last time, I realized that one of the things I want to do as a parent is to equip my daughter particularly on the ability to take care of herself. So I found this self-defense course where she learned how to, um, well, she learned how to kick a man in a certain spot so they'll leave her alone, and she learned how to throw people away and how to get away from people. And actually she stayed, she and her girlfriend took the advanced course in uh, self-defense. Has anybody in here had a course like that? See, I, I have you. Good. See, I think it ought to be a requirement for high school students, and particularly women. Um, anyway, so she took this course, and um, this uh, her instructor 
would have had a helmet on and pads and his groin area and all over his chest. And he would attack these women. There were only two or three high school students. Most of them were middle-aged women. There was about 20 of them in the class. And uh, he would attack them and try to get them to laugh. He didn't want to scare them. But he said, if I can get you to laugh, then I'm control of the emotional field of what's going on. The idea is you have to think clearly and logically and be aware no matter what's happening. Not let your fear take over, but think about what you have to do to get out of the way. So his motif was to, was to get them to laugh when he attacked them. He'd go, ready? And yeah, and then he would go after them like he was going to choke them or catch them from behind. And he'd say funny things, and I laughed all the time. But, but you could, if you were the, <laughs> I watched a few times they did this. Uh, anyway, so she had had this course. So I felt good as a parent in terms of moving her on, let her go do what she wants to, because I'd given her tools to equip her. And that's pretty much all you can do as a parent, not let your own fears overrun her. So I had all these somewhat illogical fears. Well, well what, what happens if so? Dad, I'll be okay. And besides, uh, I can just pull into a filling station, and uh, you know I'll be all right, and I'll travel in the daytime. I'll call you when I get there. This is before cell phones. I'll call you when, uh, well, before I leave. And she said, besides, Dad, I can take a man's eyes out. And I said, okay, no curfew, do whatever you want. Just cool. And there's something within me as a dad that said, this is good. She has awareness of space and light and dark and what's safe to go into, not safe. A sense of doing that. And all of that is ego development. All of that is good ego boundary development. A few more. I have the right to make mistakes and be responsible for them. It's called contrition. Contrition. I blew it. I was wrong, like Fonzie never could say on TV. I was wrong. To be responsible for myself. I have a right to change my mind. I have a right to say I don't know, and other people do too. Other people have a right to change their mind. I have a right to say I don't understand. I have a right to say I don't care. You might duck when you say I don't care. Um, but you have a right to say that. I have a right to offer no reasons or excuses for justifying my, my, justifying my behavior. I just don't want to. Well, why? I just choose not to do that. But why did you spend the money on that? It's because something I wanted to do. But what was the reason? I don't have to give you a reason. It was something that I decided to do with the money that was mine to invest it in this. See? E good ego development allows us to do that. Uh, another one is, I have the right to have my opinions given respect, and so do you. If there's somebody who doesn't respect my opinion over time, they don't have to agree with it, then they, they're not my friends. I don't hang around people who it's either their way or the highway. You know what I'm saying? People like that. Good ego boundaries. Uh, I have, have needs that my, have my needs be as important as the needs of others. I have a right to tell someone what my needs are. And they have a right to tell me what their needs are. I have a right to judge my own behavior, thoughts, emotions, and be responsible for their consequences upon myself. I have a right to judge if I am responsible for finding solutions to your problems. This, is, this gets into heavy family therapy stuff. Because most of us are fixers. We think love means fixing somebody else's problems. We, we fail to see sometimes love is listening and supporting and not fixing. Um, it seems like I tell parents a lot in my counseling work, excuse me, I tell, I tell parents this too, and high school students, I, I tell parents, no unsolicited advice. Don't give any more unsolicited advice. After they're about 15 or 16, you can say, would you like some advice to your teenager? And they can say, yes, I would, or no, I wouldn't. But don't be, you know, but see, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm giving you advice about not to give advice. But, uh, and a few more is to, I take pride in my body. I have a right to do that, and others do too, and to define attractiveness on my terms, not on anybody else's terms. See, that's huge. Most of us define it on terms of television or media. I have a right to grow and learn and change and value my age and experience. And others do too. And I have a right sometimes to make demands on others. And others sometimes have a right to make demands on me. Because sometimes love... So love has to be a bit tough. Sometimes love has to be tough on me. Sometimes love has to be tough on somebody else. D d does this make sense, kind of, sort of, in terms of ego development? It's uh, kind of a lot of Dr. Phil kind of stuff, but it's basic 
ego development. From Dr. Herb. Stay tuned. No. Um, okay, last time we were looking at, uh, I want to look at more of this before we have our little deal. And we looked at these fears, I'll just to go over it. And uh, the fear of being smothered, the fear of being abandoned, the fear of being attacked or, or, and the fear of being exposed, the fear of change, the fear that our instincts would turn on us, and the fear of the unknown and death. These are fears that underline all of our lives uh, all the time, and, and ego development is coming to terms with that. And I think when we look at uh, diversity and uh, 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 cultural differences, personal differences, I think a lot of it is just fear, because we don't know. I always have told my white friends, you'll change your opinions of black people when you, get, when you have a black friend. Have you all discovered that? If you find one person of another ethnicity or race and they become your friend, it changes your view of everyone. Um, uh, somebody was saying, I think after class, was it, did you say it, Charity? No. Somebody in the class said that the two primal fears of a child is a fear of noise. Do you want to get credit for that? No, no. I was just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The fear of noise and then the fear of falling. Yeah are the two primal uh, sort of instinctual fears. And of course those would probably have to do with abandonment or, uh, or fear of dying. But fear of falling and fear of loud noises or something seems to be in the DNA of every human being in every culture, every tribe. Okay. Um, now let me talk a little bit about ego development because I'm trying to get to some place uh, that I just haven't gotten to yet, so push down right here. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, hi. Wait, I'll hold my hand there for, is that on there? Is that our, is that UT? Somebody told me the UT symbol. U, U of H? Oh, Freudian slip, my gosh. I went to UT, I got my master's and my doctorate from U of H. Somebody said the U of H symbol, is, does anybody know how it came like this? Yeah. Push the button, Dale. Oh, <laughs> okay. Hey, wait. Don't go to sleep on TV. This is really important. This will be on the test. Yeah. Our cougar man, because that's when we had a lot of cougars and stuff. Yeah. Our mascot, it hurt its like paw on the way to Austin, <laughs> Texas. So they found out about it. Yeah. So in the, in the stand during the football game, they were doing like this. Upside down, like this, as if they lost their fourth hand, stuff like that. Then the next year, the next year we tied them. Then the year after that, um, we beat them. We beat them like bad. So we just put it up like this. Oh, instead and of down, down, you to yeah. turn it up. That's how it came. You, you but see, because a lot of people think it's U H. People think it's flicking. And some off people UT. think it's U T, and then the oh, it's thing. flicking off U T. I'm yeah, not like sure what that means, but uh, <laughs> perhaps you know what that means. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. You get so many tidbits in this class. I mean, this is life-changing stuff. Thank you for that. That's good. Now, what was I doing? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're looking at ego development. And um, hold on. Don't go away. Um, and one of the things we've looked at, hold on, is uh, we were looking at the ego right here. And... Uh, and I, we've been, been looking at this before, but it's the seat of our willpower, the center of our decision making, going fast. We looked at the functions of the ego Ta -da! Uh, to orient us to time and space, give a sense of groundedness. These are all the basic developmental things of Freudian psychology and er Ericksonian psychology. You know, trust versus mistrust. And then the second stage is autonomy. We differentiate ourselves from mother. And everybody in the world. See that first stage, we're sort of undifferentiated. You know, mother and child are bonded as one. And then, uh, so the, the other function is to help us stand on our own feet and develop our own, uh, uh, to separate. And the third one is to establish an identity uh, th around authority figures through making connections. And, uh, and then something I ended last time with was, the real question is who authors your life? Who writes your life? And we've looked at some level it's from nature, some level it's from nurture, some level it's your own DNA, and at some level it's culture, it's family, 
it's uh, in the film we had last class. Remember they had that little black uh, little baby, and they said if this child was born in China, what what would be its culture? Chinese. Yeah, it'd be a Chinese culture. Um, wouldn't that be interesting? I've never met an Afro American, someone of that heritage, who grew up in, in a Chinese culture. Wouldn't that just be interesting? Do you have? Well, push the button and tell us about it, Sage. On Sugarland and our neighbors, I guess, uh, they were for Slumberger or something yeah. like that. And he had a, pro a contract in, in uh, Beijing years ago, and his daughter was born there. She's a good friend of mine. So and she speaks Chinese? Chinese fluent. I mean, she's, her Chinese is even better than English, and she kind of got, got the culture over there. Yeah, yeah, and then see, and then, you know, that's, isn't that like interesting? Because what it does is it busts up our stereotypes. You can't say physically our physicality and our body, our DNA determines our culture because it doesn't. Uh, it comes from so much more than that. Okay, so, but uh, what I want to talk about today is, uh, is how the ego grows. And uh, because uh, I guess this is way up there today. Okay, how the ego grows. How it develops, and the first way it develops is uh, it develops through uh, gratification. How it grows, it grows through gratification, or satiation. S a t i a t i o n, satiation of needs. The human being, for the ego to grow and for you to get established and grounded and differentiate and establish identity, you have to have your needs gratified. Um, it has to do with soothing. It has to do with uh, comforts. Comforts to lessen pain. <laughs> See? Interesting. What's the first experience of the human baby when it's born into the world? What's its first emotional experience? Crying. Crying. Yeah, welcome to this life. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, think about it. To the child, it must think it's dying. It is, it is being changed from one way of existing in the world to a whole other way of existing in the world. Its existence is it gets its food and, and it eliminates through this umbilical cord. And it's in this uh, amniotic fluid that supports it and, and uh, comforts it, keeps the temperature just right. It's protected, see, and this, this child basically lives in another world. And so for the child to be born and have, I mean, the eyes aren't working, the ears aren't working, although they say kids can hear things. Uh, uh, fetuses can. But from the child's perspective, the child must think it's dying if it's moving from one way of functioning in life and getting its needs met to a whole other way. And it's like umbilical cord, whack! You're going to have to eat through your mouth. You're going to have to eliminate through the other end. And uh, all of a sudden, from the child's perspective, you see the radical transition in its existence. And so, number one, wonder it cries. It says, feed me, help me. I'm afraid, I'm abandoned, I'm scared. And uh, what are some ways that we gratify a, a, a little child? <laughs> Bomb candy. candy. What, what are some ways we satiate the needs of the child? What are the needs of the child? Say it again. This is not rocket science. Yeah, it's a, it's a holding, food, candy, and <laughs> probably not. Candy is not a necessity, but food is a necessity. And what else? Uh, uh, clothes, uh, you know, a holy uh, is changing them. These are ways that they get their knees met. Listen, this is why, and this is all of us in this class, and probably everybody ever take this on TV, all of us got our needs met in those first three to four or five years of life. And there are 10,000 babies that are dying, I've heard, every day in the world because they just don't get enough to eat. And you can't develop your life if you don't have a life to develop. And I think it's important to kind of look at that. Is satisfying our needs is very important. If in this class, 
if I said, I don't want anybody to eat next class in the morning. No, excuse me. I don't want you to eat the night before class. I don't want you to have any breakfast. I want you to come to this class having not eaten for 12, 18 hours. What, what are likely to be our experiences of us in the class? Irritable, faint, weak, hungry. hungry. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and the ego begins to freak out. It can't function well. You begin to look around at other people and get angry at them. Uh, you begin to look at me and get real angry at me. <laughs> and you see, and what happens is you, your ego starts decompensating. And you look over and find somebody that's got a part of a sandwich they threw away and, and you want to go pick it up out of the dumpster and eat it. And you know, there are people that do that. And why are they doing that? It's because their ego demands gratification. You have to get your basic needs met. See? And when you do that, the message we get is the world is safe. S-A-F-E. That's the gift of getting your needs gratified. And this is all the way through that we have to do this. And the goal is to, uh, to lessen pain lessen pain by getting our needs met. And so the ego will grow with that, that needs get met. Your ability to expand and enlarge in your personality to a large degree is because you're getting your needs, your wants, your desires met. And desires and wants and needs are not evil. They're human experiences. And you have to get them met. See? And, and, uh, so that's how the ego grows. You have to get your... Because as meaning the ego grows, meaning you develop more sense of willpower, more decision-making ability, more safety and trust in the world because you're getting your needs met. Are you with me? So when we start, ta when we, so when we start talking about how to make the world a better place, we better feed people. See, we better feed them not only for their biological needs but for their ego needs. And, uh, you know, half the world lives on less than $2 a day. And somebody told me that there's something like 20 million women every day that leave dump heaps uh, scurrying around and digging for food for them and their families. And that mother knows ego gratific that gratification, satiation, satisfying of comfort needs, food, clothing, shelter needs are vital for her child. I worked at the mental health center for almost seven years, and I worked with a lot of people that were mentally ill and street people now we call them and many of these people lacked ego strength because they grew up in, in experiences where they didn't get their needs met obviously is a biological consideration but, but that's at a minimum uh, a second one is a second way the ego grows is through uh, stimulation uh, and stimulation is through stimulation and it forces growth forces growth because stimulation uh, tells the ego it is <laughs> that it exists the infant will not prosper if it's not stimulated you know those little mobiles mobiles we hang up above the crib you know those little uh, things you wind up and go around, and that little kid just looks at it and goes, ugh, uh, 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 uh. and uh, I remember my, my son, who we're uh, training for a bike ride together, and he's uh, 31 now, and I remember uh, a gift he got his first week that he was alive uh, was from a, a friend who was a college student, um, and he, she gave him a little Andy Pandy doll, <laughs> you know, those little Andy Pandy dolls, black and white doll, and it was one of the first things he focused on. You can watch his eyes move, see, and and uh, he cried when I walked in the room. No, he, uh, but he did. No, he'd hold the Andy Pandy, and his eyes would focus on it. And when you play with the kid, coochie coochie goo, all that stuff, what you're doing is you're stimulating them. And when you stimulate them, it makes the brain uh, uh, begin to activate, and the ego begins to grow through stimulation. And see, one of the reasons you come out here to school is so you can be stimulated with new ideas, new experiences of life. Because that will cause you to grow because you're not going to... See, if you find the perfect little safe place, you never meet any new people, never hear any new ideas, never have any things that, that scares you, awes you, creates wonder, mystery, disturbs you, then your ego will not grow. 
And it's funny, our egocentricity wants us to say, I just want to have a safe place. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said the safest place may be the most dangerous place. Because you don't grow, you don't develop. You don't learn how to cope with life because we try to escape life, see. Um, the people with the stronger egos are those who've been tested and challenged in life. Athletics do that, don't they? Those of you that do sports. Relationships test us, stimulate us, <laughs> positively and negatively. Remember another uh, synonym for love is hurt. And relationships stimulate you uh, e either way. Positive or negative. So, in a stimulation, thinking of the child, uh, things like uh, like touching, speaking to the child, feeding, and again, these are just not satiating; these are stimulating things. Reading to a child, and of course, uh, playing with a child. Playing with a child. All of these are stimulating things to do. Uh, the child will not pos prosper unless it is awakened. Its ego will not prosper unless it's awakened to the environment. They did a study uh, years ago. I, heard, I read of a study where, and this is a little bit uh, maybe, uh, what's the word, um, too, too normal or something, uh, modern normal stereotype but theoretically when the father comes home from work and he grabs the child and throws the child up in the air and the mother's getting the child ready for bed or something these are stereotypes that don't happen but that whole experience they used to think it would disturb the child they found out that if you had that when you were growing up like like that testosterone you know the, the somebody comes and takes you out of that world and plays with you takes you out of your slumber, excites you, that that actually helps you cope with uh, tragedies and sudden uh, surprises in later life because it stimulates a hormone in your body that allows you to be able to deal with the unexpected. See, And certainly that's uh, it's very, very stimulating. Uh, they found years ago in a study, which I don't have, in crib deaths, over 100% cure of these children dying in their cribs by just being held just being held, that stimulation. And we need this so bad as human beings. To, the handshake, the appropriate touch on the shoulder, the, uh, those gestures. And some cultures do this more than other cultures. How many come from touching cultures in here where people will touch each other and embrace? And, and how many come from more distant cultures where you don't touch and embrace? Yeah. Yeah. And, and see, and, and some of that's years of tradition uh, that that determine the kind of stimulation we get or don't, or don't get growing up. Uh, but, the, but the ego develops uh, along, along that and through that. Um, and then let me do the last one here on how the ego grows. And that would be... Um, does anybody know what the third thing might be? I've, I've taught this in other classes, basic psychology stuff. What's the other thing that helps people grow? It's approval. Approval says you belong. You're wanted. You're you are okay. <laughs> I mean, approval is as essential as breathing for the young child. And think about culture. And how we learn to adapt to the parents as a subculture, the family, the religious world, the greater uh, environment, society we're in, as culture. And it says, here are the rules. The first thing the child says is, who's in charge and what are the rules? <laughs> and because I know that my existence is, I got to please daddy, I got to please mommy, I got to please those caregivers who are going to satiate my needs and are going to stimulate me for life. And approval is so much a part of life. Uh, that most of us fail to realize. Let me show you something here. During, uh, in seven year cycles, zero to seven years, the primary source of approval is what? Parents. Yeah. And then seven to 14, the, uh, too glad I didn't do that in the microphone. Uh, seven to 14 uh, years, 
the approval comes from both parents and who? Yeah, peers. Did I already do this? But y'all are just sharp enough to figure it out. Yeah, common sense. That's right. And then, um, <coughs> excuse me, 14, adolescents. This is always a tough one. We know it's 28. It's not 21. Adolescence in this culture probably goes to we have the longest adolescence of any culture ever in in human existence. That's long. It's not 21. It used to be at one time if you lived on the farm uh, in medieval times uh, in Western culture, you know, people would be matched to marry when they were 13, 14, 15. Uh, you're pretty much out on your own and working. But now we have so much uh, uh, protection and safety, and uh, you can wait to grow up for a long, long time. And so this is adolescence, and during our adolescence, our uh, primary source of approval is peers. Peer pressure is more important than parent pressure. And then, and that's not taken away from the parents, but then this old thing called the self. What you want to do with your life, what seems, what you approve of. You can't go through your life pleasing everyone else all the time. Or pleasing your parents. I mean, if you're 35, 40 year old, still doing what mommy says, you, you, you need to come see me or somebody for counseling. <laughs> because you've got to work through that. And th that doesn't mean you don't respect your parents or, or seek their wisdom and insight. But if your life is based on the approval of some peer, what everybody else thinks totally when you're 45, 50, even 35, or your mommy and daddy who've been dead for years and you're still saying, well, mom wouldn't want me to go do this, you know. She would roll over in her grave. I'd say, roll, baby, roll. Let her roll. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dale, you had a question? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think marriage partner would be part of peers. And then, and then look at this, and I'll, so, and then somewhere around 28 to 35, and maybe this is more like 40 or 42 in this culture, who knows. Uh, then really, you, you want to, the self, the deeper self, the true self. What our poem Stevie was saying, I want somebody to find me behind Stevie. See, what she's saying is, I'm tired of being what the parents want, the peers want, playing out my life to them, so I can get approval I'm looking for what's inside. And ultimately, that's what it is, is to follow that inner world as it unfolds. And that's what college and education, through gratification, stimulation, and approval, we move from others toward ourselves. Now, let me just throw this in, and then we'll have our little, uh, have our presentation today. This is, let me say this, <clears throat> a few more things here. This is the sense uh, to be me. To be me. The sense to be me. <laughs> How approving and accepting is my environment. And the ego cannot contain in consciousness that which authorities don't prove of. The ego cannot contain uh, what's uh, disapproved. The ego cannot contain it. <clears throat> what's unacceptable, <clears throat> what's unacceptable we do three things with. And I, we're going to look more at this later. But this, is, this is really the meat of this class. It took me a long time to get there, but you're going to love it. What's unacceptable to our, care, our peers, our parents, the things that, that are not approved of, we do three things with them. One is we, we repress them. And what does repress mean? It means, uh, should I draw my little figure here? <laughs> it means something came up and we pushed it back down. For example, you're five years old, you see your mom in bed with a mailman or male woman. <laughs> why, why did I know when I talked about sex you would all listen now you see your a parent in bed with somebody else and you're five years old and you see that 
and the, your parent looks at you with the eyes that say, if you ever tell this to anybody, I'll kill you. That sounds funny, but these things happen. What is a child going to do with that information? Repress. Repress it, absolutely. Or, strangely enough, and this is psychology class, and we're at the university, uh, your uncle fondles you, and you're nine years old. You're a boy, or a little boy, or a girl, and, and your uncle or some strange person touch you in an inappropriate way. And this uncle you love, or this aunt you love, because they're real friendly and, warm, and nice people, and they do something that you know is inappropriate. Now, if you come from a healthy family, you go immediately to your parents and say, what happened? But see, if you, if you grow up with people who don't teach you how to take care of yourself and say, we'll love you unconditionally no matter what, then what do you do with that information? You repress it. That means you push it back down into the unconscious. And then that, that, uh, that example, for example, for, for example, may act out in your relationships later, in your uh, self-esteem, in rage and anger because you've been hurt and violated, and it'll come out through the rest of your life. And that's what a lot of psychotherapy is, is helping people deal with stuff that they couldn't deal with because their ego wasn't strong enough to deal with it when they were younger. And so as you get older and stronger, and I've had many people in their 30s, 40s, 50s tell me things in my practice that they've never told anybody. And these are wonderful people just like us. And they finally they've needed to tell their story to someone and the things that they've repressed. And just the act of telling it to a caring person who has compassion and, and a warmth and empathy has a healing effect. It's what Freud called talking therapy. You just talk it out and you get somebody doesn't judge you and you go, wow, you mean I'm, I'm okay? I'm, and see, it's very important. The second thing we, uh, that we do with things we can't, that's not approved of, is we suppress it. I think it has two Ps. And we suppress it. And what does suppress mean? That means we never let it up. We never, it never comes up. And it might be that uh, you grow up in a family of athletes and you want to play the violin and you're a guy and you're the biggest, strongest athletic person in the family and you want to play the violin. And father, mother, big brothers all say, like hell, a real man plays football. And you're saying... I want to play my violin. I mean, well, you don't even say it because to say it would be, then you have to repress it. You learn to suppress it. Or if you want to do art. Or if you're a homosexual and you have these feelings and you just don't let them out. And we say coming out of the closet. And that's people often letting their own sexual identity out after years of suppressing it because it was unacceptable in their religion, their family, to themselves. You see what I mean? So suppression is you never let it out. And a lot of things that are suppressed you don't even know about. And then the third thing we do with this is, uh, does anybody know? <clears throat> is we, we project it. Is projection. And what is projection? Ject means throw, pro means out. <laughs> we throw it out. What does that mean? That means the things in my life that haven't been acceptable, that are buried down here, either I hold them down and, and they're suppressed and they cause psychosomatic illnesses and keep us from the freedom we were born to experience like I just read earlier, or we repress them, uh, we, they've never come up or we hold them down, or we do, watch this, is we project them out on other people. Or Play, or things or things in life. We project it out. In other words, we throw it out of ourselves onto another so that the people I really hate often, we are what we hate. The things you don't like in other people often may be something in yourself you haven't come to accept. I know you don't want to hear that. You are like your mother. There, the moan goes through the... You are like your... You are, and the other thing is true. I mean, that's a negative thing, but positively you're like your mother or you're like some TV star or movie star. It's a positive projection. The things we like about other people that are talents and gifts that are in our unconscious, we throw those out on other people too. So if you made a list of three things you don't like about people, there are probably things about yourself you haven't come to terms with. Those are called negative projections. And three things you don't like... You do like about somebody, it may be 
something about yourself you haven't discovered and you need to work on it in yourself. It's a positive and negative projections. And we're going to look more at that as the class goes on. Because I think this is where cultural psychology and diversity is just fabulous. You can learn so much about yourself when you learn, uh, embrace this idea of projection. And let me say this. This is uh, chapter one and chapter two of Owning Your Own Shadow by Robert Johnson. The little book you bought, now's the time to read it. There's three chapters. <laughs> But chapter one and two, I had a stu uh, one of my clients the other day said, that is the longest short book I've ever read. Because every two or three sentences makes me think a lot. See, But he talks about projection in there. And uh, that's what that is about. So that I learn a lot about myself on, from other people and my feelings and reactions towards others. And we'll look at that. Okay, that's a lot of good stuff for the test. And we'll look at more of it because we have more classes before the test. But any questions on that? You see what we just did today? We said... We, we looked at the ego grows through gratification, and it grows through stimulation, and it grows through approval. And what's not approved of, I, I don't know if it's okay to end a sentence in a preposition. I think it is if you can't go anyplace else with it. Uh, what's not approved or what is disapproved, what's not acceptable, you have to do something with it. Either you hold it in, you, it either comes up and you hold it down, or you never let it up, or you project it out on other people. And the richness of life is discovering your projections. The things I hate in others are often things in myself I haven't come to terms with. The things I adore in others are things about myself I haven't, uh, I'm not honoring and finding and discovering. And I'll give you some great examples and we'll look at a lot more of that later. Okay, we got some great uh, uh, little uh, deals today, uh, presentations today on uh, stuff on uh, WASP striking back and uh, why man's knapsack. So give these guys a big hand. I'm not supposed to turn your back to the camera. But how am I going to move this without doing that? <clears throat> nice, nice weak applause. Isn't that stuff interesting about the ego? I'm giving you all way too much information uh, that uh, you'll understand so much more. It'll be fun. Uh, Sage and Deo and Jason right here. Good job, guys. Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by um, Peggy McIntosh. And with this um, essay, she basically talking about talking about racism, but she's talking about it in not the traditional way. She's talking about it on the other side of the scale. Instead of writing on how African Americans are being oppressed and disadvantaged, she writes about how whites are privileged and advantage in everyday life. First she starts off by giving an example how males have certain privileges over women that they don't relinquish. And then she introduces the privileges that whites have. She then talks about how white no about what she thinks she can do to learn I mean, lesson or end this privilege. From there, she goes on to talk about how the ideas of having these privileges were never introduced to her in the educational system when she was younger. It was almost as if it was covered up like a conspiracy. Then Macintosh decides to list out many of the white privileges that occur in normal everyday life. Examples of this include being able to shop alone and not worry about being followed, watching television and reading newspapers without her race widely represented, I mean, with her race widely represented, doing well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to her own race, and having the ability to choose a, a blemish cover or bandage in the flesh cover of what she is, and having more or less match her skin color. She then seemed to come to the realization that her skin color has always been to, to uh, always been a tool to her to do anything that she, cho she chose fit. She feels like the whole racial system has been like a scale. The more confident and comfortable white people were made, the less confident and comf comfortable non-white groups were being made. She then decides that if the problem is to be fixed, we must distinguish between the positive and negative privileges and work with those. One thing that she is sure about is that a change is possible, but it will take a long time. 
Now, I got three questions, and, like, somebody's going to answer them. <laughs> All right. Is, is white privilege something that can be decreased? Do y'all think that it could be de decreased? You. <laughs> well, it's not that something should be increased or decreased. Everyone should just be on the same level. So if you have someone on one level and then, like, minorities on another level, you should do whatever you can to get them on the same level. So if that means decreasing the whites and then upgrading minorities, then that's what you should do. But they should all be on the same level. You shouldn't have to decrease somebody. Just up, upgrade the others so they're on the same level. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got anything to say about that? No? All right, the second question is, is there any privileges that other races receive that whites don't? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, it's kind of like where you're at. I'm talking about like in U.S. Because in actuality, if you look at the statistics, white women benefit from affirmative action on anybody. Ooh. How's that? I, mean, I don't know about affirmative action. I'm kind of curious. Because affirmative action just isn't limited to race. It says minority groups, and that also includes women. And more often than not, white women benefit more from it than somebody that's African American or Hispanic or Asian. Ooh, that's interesting. Interesting. I didn't know that, didn't know that either. Did you read that like in an article or something? Or? Do what? Yeah, it, no, I mean, I mean, I'm not questioning it, but that, that's, that's fascinating. White women benefit from affirmative action more than minorities, male or female. Right. Right. Wow. Um, I don't really think that affirmative action is like um, a privilege because I think in the article she also mentioned that um, those people who do re receive affirmative action say like with like a white employer or uh, with an employer that does it, you know, kind of affirmative action, most of the co-workers are always suspicious or they suspect that you receive the job not by your virtue but by your affirmative action, like by hmm. being under that constitution. Wow. Alright, alright, third question. Uh, what do y'all think could be considered as a white disadvantage? Anybody? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> What's a white disadvantage? Well, those are great questions. Any white disadvantages? reading this in an article, the fact that like um, like whites don't know Ebonics as well as some minority races, that's looked at as That's a stretch there. Uh, uh, like if, it, it, was, it was relating to like um, how, it was relating how to like, uh, like SAT use it, is made for predominantly white class and yeah, it's a biased exam. And it was actually in my psych book from last semester, and they said that, you know, if they made it more, if they put in a few more Ebonics terms, then some minorities would be able to do better. So that could be it. I really don't know. What about you, Dr. Agan? Oh, um, like, I'm white. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get extra credit for that. Um, well, actually, no. The, um, th that's a good question. You, See, I, I, my, I've been privileged to be around minorities in my work, and, I've, and I've, in many ways I've chosen to do that. And it's enlarged into my world. My gosh, it's, uh, it's been humbling. It's been, uh, I've discovered much more breadth and depth of life and creativity and friendship and everything. And, and see, that there's a deal called the impoverished rich white man. He's got all the money and all the power but he's lonely because he can't just be a human being. He can't just be. He can't just go dance, have a good time, have friends that love him and care for him because he's always in that. It's kind of like the, uh, what's the word, the CEO complex. The CEO of a corporation is usually the loneliest man or woman at the top. 
because people can't relate to them. And, and you know, I know from the perspective of minorities, it looks like, well, what's he talking about? But uh, a lot of, uh, you know, being right and having power doesn't necessarily give you life and soulfulness and happiness. And I don't mean soulfulness in the black contents, but as a human being. Because you know what happens? You get all your needs met, but you don't get stimulated to grow. A lot of minority people have a lot of stimulation because they're having to deal in a, a situation where they have no power, but often don't get their needs met. And uh, it creates a whole other scene. But uh, I think there's an, there are a lot of white people who are not very alive. Are you all with me, kind of, sort of? You think that's kind of true? I do. Hello, my name is Sage. Um, I did my article on the epidemic of white underclass. Quite interesting. Um, the name of the guy is Charles Moore. Um, basically, was talking about. Black and white community and how it affects society in general. Um, for those of you who don't know what illegitimacy is, uh, <laughs> a single parent have a baby, not necessarily she's not married or parents, whatever. Um, that, this article was also written in 1991. 68% Back in 91, 68% of African Americans were African American kids were from parents that were single or parents that, a single parent mother or in that case, a woman that wasn't married was African American. And at the same token, for the wives it was about 22% back in 91. Um, and this guy Charles Murray, his whole insight and his whole take on this article is about how his, his main point is about how it's going to affect society if the rate changes and it is, as it increases. Um, at 68 percent, this is just in the African American, just in in the U.S. in general. But for inner city, like what we call you know the ghetto or in the projects, it's about 80 percent. Wow. For African Americans, so that's wow. a pretty high rate. Um, and it has been a proven fact that an uh, enormous amount of crimes due to this, a lot of crimes with the, with the illegitimacy rate, it, it increases the crime rate in, in African American communities as well as in white communities because of you know, bank robberies and the you know, unemployment rate is high and that affects the economy you know, to a certain degree. Um, and he went on to talk about the three main solutions that he had for us as a society for the whites and blacks to somewhat to eliminate the problems to kind of keep the numbers down low because at this rate the whites are 22 percent and his main argument is about how the illegitimacy rate for white is 22 percent and if that rate exceeds 25 percent it's going to put us in some kind of catastrophe you know, a big big dilemma for the country and the economy and unemployment rates and a lot of other things and some of the, the solutions he came up with was for, for the first one, <clears throat> his, his uh, I guess his calculation on that is to, to end all like support from the government, for example, like welfare and, um, you know, food stamps, you know, like cheap housing, like in a project and stuff like that. Um, that's his first, that's his first solution on that. And he, he figured by that, but by, 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 by one of the, by those solutions, things have changed a great deal. Um, his second his second solution was that to use the money like the money that the government is using on projects and welfare. His take on that is to give the money to uh, give the money to 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 to, 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 um, to welfare like to uh, welfare agency or to the agencies to like help improve like the homes for kids. That are being the kids that are like being adopted, like you know, um, open more homes here. That's what I have here. Um, and the reason for that is that will give women, uh, that will give women more ability, more, 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 more chance to like put their kids out for adoption. 
uh, adoption instead of them having to, you know, either disown the kid or, you know, let the kid grow up with our parents and end up, you know. The have you got a question? Yeah, and no pressure, man, I have a question. Pressure. And uh, his third, the last, his last solution is to restore the rewards of marriage. By that, he means to um, give families that are like married give the mo give money to families that are married, and as opposed to putting all that money into welfare. Um, cool. And a few questions I have is. Um, As a class in whole, what do you guys uh, take? Uh, what do you, what do you think about you know the the what do you think? What, what's your solution? What kind of ideas would you come up with that will you know help society as a whole keep the illegitimacy rate down? Or what would you you know what do you think will help us as a society? Anybody? It seems like his solution might keep the illegitimacy level down, but it wouldn't like create good families. It would create people who would stay together and marry, but they wouldn't be raising the child well because they'd be staying together because of economics or other things. I don't, I don't think just decreasing the illegitimacy rate would solve problems of children. Good answer. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, another one, another question. I only, I only have one, one big question. That was it. Okay, great. Good job. Let's just <laughs> sorry to move y'all along, but we have the clocks moving. Uh, my name is Jason Straw. Um, my article was about uh, the name of what's called. I'm tired to write it down. The wasp says um, stings back. Yeah, wasp. Right What's a wasp? Yeah. It's a um, white Anglo-Saxon product. And uh, basically it's, um, I cannot put this. It's um, white people who really don't have a, who believe in a certain uh, religion. It's basically, uh, they believe in Christ, but they're not, uh, they're not, uh, Catholic. 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 Yeah, Catholic. But um, he, he talks about um, how he's tired of uh, the stereotype, and he talk, he's, he's tired about he talks about uh, um, they write in articles about how um, he say that wops have no honor, and he basically he means that by um, saying that. Well, basically, he's saying that that um, also people that have honor. He's saying he's saying that um, I'm sorry, let me put my notes together. He says he states that Wapsa invented the idea of limited government. So, without what I what I should say, without the Wapsa. There wouldn't be no limit to go. We might be under one dictation. Mm -hmm. And um, I just have a question. Do you feel? Do you feel as though? I mean, as a class, do you feel as though you can believe you can um, work in society without changing your views? As far as do you believe? Do you have to conform to the? To the, I don't mean to be racist. I don't mean to offend anybody. Do you feel that you have to conform to the white society in order to succeed in life? Can anybody? That's a good ask question. A question? Yeah, I feel like I have to conform a lot to be a professional and make a lot of money coming from like some of the things that I used to do back in high school and people I hang around. So it's a big difference. Do anybody feel that they can just be themselves and believe in their own beliefs and still succeed in life? Or do you feel like you may have to you have to make some sacrifices? I think you can be yourself and be hundred percent yourself and still succeed in life. I think I'm doing really that personally. I feel like I'm myself, and I'm succeeding, I think. Um, do you have a comment, Kalea? Uh, I was going to say, I think you, you can be yourself to a certain extent, but uh, it just depends like, on what kind of profession you want, because in corporate America, 
and this is not for anybody, but you can only be so black in corporate America, and it's just, um, you don't want to compromise yourself, and you, I think everyone has to assimilate to a certain extent in order to be successful, but it's only a problem when you compromise who you are in order to gain your success. Mm -hmm. I feel that because, um, like, when people go to interviews, there's like a certain standard they already know that you like good, dress well, right. talk through a certain way. And just the fact that you have to do that at an interview, an interview that's supposed to find out who you are, but you change yourself just so you can succeed in the interview. I feel like when you, when you try to make it in like that's what you gotta do. You gotta change yourself just enough to get in the door. And then when you get in there, then you can start becoming more of right. yourself. That's good. Like, I mean, and that's, that's to a certain extent, too, because I mean, once you, I mean, like I have a buddy of mine who just land a job with a, with a consultant with Ernest, I mean, Pricewaterhouse uh, County Firm, and he, you know, really smart cat, you know, like a 3.6 right. year or so, but, you know, society kind of judges you by your outer appearance right. in most cases and the way you carry yourself, not right. necessarily based on what you know. Because they even asked him to cut his hair because he had a fro. Right. And stuff like that. But he was brilliant guy. And he left the company and went to grad school last semester. Do something so else. But your appearance doesn't matter a lot. Yeah, that's good. I thought you, you can be yourself. But to a certain extent, I think once you in a position where you have control as far as if you own your own business, then from there you can actually be yourself. But until you get to that point, right. I actually feel you have to make sacrifices. You know? I, I'm not racist, but I, honestly, I do feel that I'm living in a white society, and I must perform sometimes. You know, I don't, and I mean, I'm a, um, a set or anything like that. It's just sometimes you have to make some sacrifices to get to the next level. That's how it is. Okay, thanks, guys. Good job. Great job. Great job. Let me uh, let me just share one thing that they're all hitting on. That's so good. Is uh, um, it's this concept of uh, we we still got a couple of minutes and, and you know me I can give give a lot of good stuff in a couple of minutes is uh, the two themes of life is uh, fitting <clears throat> fitting in first half of life you fit in and the second half of life to a large degree you do what is about fitting out the first one's about joining the society and the second part is about making sure you're an individual. See, it's doing both. And I'm not saying, well, Freud said this. He said the price of civilization is neurosis because in order to fit into your family, it's not just the white culture, although uh, obviously the United States is predominantly run. It's run by white people and white people's money and white people have all the power, much of the power. Uh, well, it could be your parents. That your job is you got to get food, clothing, and shelter. <laughs> you got to fit in at a certain level. This is what's so terrible about people from abusive homes. You know, where are they going to go? If you're getting beat and shamed and hurt physically, emotionally, psychologically, where are you going to run away to when you're five and six years old? Fortunately, we're in a culture now that says Children Protective Service, if you even hear of somebody being abused, you're, you're liable under the law to, do, to make a uh, anonymous phone call but the here the idea is I this is a paradox and we'll see that a lot is I both have to fit in and fit out I have to be willing to be my unique self but I have to learn how to fit into society listen if I say I don't give a dang what anybody says I'm gonna drive on the side of the street I want to and I'm gonna go through the lights if I want to go through them I'm not gonna stop at the red lights I'm gonna fit out and just do my thing well we can't have a culture can we and so part of it, it what, what we're really dealing with is the powers that be and how I can get acceptance and then how I can find my own life. And, uh, and I'm saying I as a white man, all the things I've to uh, succeed and I have, I've had to sacrifice. I love, I love the word uh, you use, Jason, the word sacrifice. I've had to sacrifice a lot of things, but ultimately they weren't sacrifices because they helped me get more power and credentials and acceptance. I think it's tougher if you're a minority. Um, but I've been a psychologist and a minister and that's kind of weird even for white people somebody to do those things uh, okay I'll have uh, next time we start uh, I'm going to show you some neat things about projection and uh, I'll see you at the next class great